Um, welcome everyone. This is the Stats PhD Grad School panel. Uh, it's just a volunteer, a joint effort between Stats students at UC Berkeley, University of Washington, and University of Michigan. Uh, yeah, and we're just gonna. The basic goal of the panel is to, sorry, um, do a couple of things. But first of all, we're gonna go through those backgrounds and goals. Talk about some of the instructions. Uh, for Q&A, uh, since this is a, a Zoom webinar, a particular setup that we're going to be using to facilitate uh, the ease of asking questions. Uh, then we're going to introduce it to everyone to the panel on the, uh, introduce everyone to the panelists, then we'll do some audience introductions, then the, from there we'll start doing some Q&A um, for me and then eventually opening up from the audience. Uh, if you have some issues, you can um, Mention those in the chat or email that um, email contact at statuebc.com. Um, and yeah, we'll get to question Q and A's in just a minute, how you would ask those. Uh, I should note that this is a like this is something that is from statue PhD students, but we're not officially representing our departments. This is all sort of informal advice that we um, have cut have thought is useful in our experience as PhD students and applicants once upon a time. So the backgrounds and goals of this, um, the applicant applying for a stats PhD or really any a grad school in general is pretty difficult and involves a lot of steps and process and processes that you may not be familiar with. And a lot of this, uh, the sort of the access people have to um, the process is influenced by things they have no control over. And we here we just really want to make the application process and the actual PhD itself more accessible for students and for anyone who's interested in pursuing a, a PhD in statistics. And in doing this, we also want to make sure we have a, a wide variety of representations and backgrounds from people who are doing different things and are from different places. Uh, so yeah, next we'll introduce our panelists. Um, so. Maybe I can go first since I'm the moderator. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm a third year thesis student at UC Berkeley. I graduated in uh, from Howard University with a degree in math, and I currently work on machine learning. Um, yeah, maybe at first we'll go to the folks who are coming from UC Berkeley. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andy. I am a second year PhD student in statistics at UC Berkeley. Uh, I did my undergraduate at UCLA, also in statistics, so go Bruins. Uh, my research uh, is more of the applied area, specifically in a methodology development in drug discovery, uh, precision medicine, and other computational biology areas. Good to meet you all. Uh, my name is Austin. Uh, I'm also a second year PhD student in statistics at Berkeley. Uh, before I came to Berkeley, I did my undergrad at Texas A&M. Uh, and I studied math and statistics, and I also got a minor in computer science. And uh, these days, my research interests uh, are mainly on machine learning theory with an emphasis on deep learning theory. Next up, uh, folks from the University of Michigan. Hi, everyone. I'm Jalen. I'm a first year PhD student at, um, at Michigan. I did my undergrad at Carleton College, also in statistics. Um, I'm a first year, so still kind of working out what my research area is going to be. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Unique. Uh, I'm a second year PhD student at Michigan. Uh, I'm originally from Nepal, but I did my undergrad uh, in mathematics from Ole Miss. Uh, currently, I am working on uh, generative models. And last but not least, University of Washington. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Apra. I'm a third year PhD student in the stats department. Um, I work on causal discovery and reinforcement learning. And uh, before UW, I got my bachelor's in uh, computer science and applied math at uh, CU Boulder, Scobuffs. And Jillian is on her way, and we can have her introduce herself when she gets here. OK, that sounds good. Um, Next up, then, we will ask the audience to put some introductions in the chat. So this is a couple of things you may want to share, uh, your name and pronouns, 
academic background, um, where you are currently, whether it's uh, if you're an undergrad or if you're in a master's program, if you're working, things like that. And maybe a brief sentence about why you're interested in this PhD and where you are currently in the world. So yeah. Let's see, let's see. Yeah, in the meantime, thanks to everyone who's come come out. Um, this is a yearly thing, but it's always good to, uh, at least it's become a yearly thing, it's, but it's always good to see new new faces and new people. Um, good to, always glad to help folks. Uh, oh yeah, and also <laughs> send your messages to everyone and not just the host and panelists so everyone can see your introductions. Okay, I'm starting to see some intros rolling in. See some folks with causal stat genetics, causal inference, um, and lots of different places too, from Cal, seeing Utah, people who are working currently. It's always good to see like a nice variety of folks. Hopefully we can get a, um, the panelists can give you a good idea of how different people from different backgrounds end up where, where we are now. Okay, um, please keep introducing yourself in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I will explain the Q&A feature. So if you look at the bottom of your sort of Zoom screen, there's a chat feature, which is where everyone is sending their introductions now, and there's a Q&A feature. Um, when you have questions to ask to the panelists, please ask them in the Q&A, and you can also see the questions that people have asked in the Q&A feature and upvote them if you agree with those questions or are interested in having those questions answered. And we'll select the questions for the panel basically roughed on, uh, basically, <laughs> uh, roughly based on, sorry, <laughs> um, the highest upvote questions. Some of them may be more simple and uh, panelists may answer them in the Q&A directly themselves, but in general, we'll choose the ones that are most upvoted. And you can submit another question basically throughout the entire panel. Uh, and just to reiterate, finally, please use the Q&A only for questions for the panel. If you need have help or need help for something else, you can send it to the chat um, or email contact at stats.com. That's the general setup. Okay. So I um do we have all our panelists now? Let's see. No, we'll yeah, I was able to join. I think you were just waiting on me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. So uh, let's get the panel started then. So I think first up, I'll ask a few questions, and then as um people start answering, we can the attendees will have some things in Q and A, and we'll go from there. But first, the one is an easy one. Why did you choose to come to the Stats PhD program? Uh, and yeah, you can jump in and if people are too quiet, I'll poke somebody. But. Okay, I guess I'll jump in since I didn't introduce myself. Um, so I'm Jillian. Um, I think everyone uh, introduce themselves. Um, I just so you know who I am. I'm a PhD student, a third year in our University of Washington statistics program, um, and I got my master's uh, down at Texas A&M before this. Um, and then my undergraduate is in uh, like psychology and theoretical math um, at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, so I'll say 
the question was like, why did I join a PhD program? Um, for me, it was not uh, a lifelong dream or a plan that I had at the beginning of any age. <laughs> um, it just kind of happened. Uh, I was in psychology before this. Uh, I was going to be in clinical psych doing PhD programs in that. And life just kind of took some turns. I got into statistics. I got my master's thinking I would be a data scientist and go into industry. Um, and then when I finished my master's, I just felt like I wanted to do more school. Um, I really liked teaching and I wanted to be able to teach at the highest level um, and not have a cap or a ceiling of where I could go. So that's why I started my PhD. But since then, I have kind of fell in love with natural language processing and will probably go into industry after for that. Um, so that was kind of my path to here. Thanks, Jillian. I think I hear a lot of themes that I've heard before, especially with like just sort of happening upon you and, you know, just keep going higher and higher. But uh, anyone else want to answer? Uh, yeah, I can chime in. So, yeah, I mean, the reason I kind of pursued a PhD is uh, I've always been very interested in uh, in research, or I shouldn't say always, since getting into my undergrad. I mean, I just picked stats in undergrad and math because I, I just liked them in high school. But uh, when I got there, I very quickly realized that I liked the idea of doing research and just spending all your time working on like new problems, almost just like for the sake of it. Uh, and when it comes to statistics, uh, I've always been very attracted to like using data to make, uh, you know, more educated decisions. But when I was applying, I also applied to a bunch of CS and biostat programs um, because eventually I realized that machine learning is the topic I really liked. Uh, and there are definitely multiple field, like multiple ways uh, you can attack that with different degrees. So um, uh, yeah, statistics ended up being the best fit, but uh, it could have it could have gone another way, uh, you know, uh, pretty easily. And I, I suspect that there are other people on this panel too who applied to programs other than just statistics. Uh, yeah, but that's my short summary. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that uh, perspective. Uh, anyone else have any divergent um, experiences that they maybe want to share with the audience? Or we can also move on to another question. I, I can jump in. So uh, I, I did pure math as an undergrad. And for the first couple of years of undergrad, I thought I would uh, go get a PhD in math. But by junior year and senior year, I had taken a couple of uh, theoretical stats class. Uh, and I thought uh, if if I go to grad school in stats, if I feel like doing just theory, I can always do that, focus more on like probability theory or stats theory. But at some point, if I want to do uh, more like applied work or methodological work, I like the flexibility that stats PhD program offers. Uh, so that's one of the reason I applied to grad school in stats. And I, I think now after coming to grad school, uh, I have like moved more to intersections of uh, theory and methodology. So uh, that uh, flexibility really worked out for me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think that's a nice thing about stats that there's a lot of directions you can go in it, go with it. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q and A. Um, oh, we're getting one now. Okay, perfect. I uh, just wanted to get to know that the Q&A is features working. We'll let those questions start rolling in. Um, but yeah, next up, I wanted to ask sort of along the lines of Austin's answer, how you decided which schools to apply to and maybe potentially what programs to apply to as well. Maybe Austin can start since you sort of already had inklings of this question in your, your response. Sure. Yeah. So I think one thing I I definitely mentioned when because I, I was on this panel last year, uh, and this can be like my advice can be a bit controversial. There are probably people on this panel who disagree, but uh, my recommendation has always been to spam as many applications as possible, uh, and I have a couple reasons for that. And so, like, just to give an idea, when I was applying, I I sent over twenty applications to different PhD programs, and like, did it take a lot of time? It did, but like uh, the amount of time it takes is not a linear function of the number of schools you're applying to because like they all require a personal statement, a statement of interest. My letter writers wrote the same letter for every school. 
Um, yeah. So, so, you know, adding 10 more schools is not result in like, uh, you know, doubling your time or anything like that. Um, and when it comes to cost, it is true that these can get expensive, but uh, I found that actually fee waivers were not hard to come by. If finances are an issue at all, um, or if you participated in any sort of uh, like RU or anything sort of diversity related, uh, they're, they actually are pretty uh, loose with the fee waivers. So you could cut the price in half at least. So the reason to get to the point, the reason why I recommend spamming applications is because, I mean, this is probably one of the most important decisions you'll make like up until that, like up until this point in your life, right? And I can tell you this, if I was only applying to six schools, I would not have included Berkeley. I probably would not have included, you know, U, UW or Michigan or anything like that. I would have just like sent one to my home institution of Texas A&M, maybe like, you know, there's nothing wrong with those schools either, but I wouldn't be where I am. And I wouldn't have ended up with a lot of those options. So I recommend spamming applications. Um, and then uh, I've always just kind of been interested in like the like the CS side of things as well. So, um, you know, like I applied to most of like the top 20 stats programs. Um, and then also I threw in a lot of CS just because um, I knew that I could do the exact same work from that degree program. So again, just increasing my chances, throwing a few biostat, throwing a few math. Uh, and at the end of the day, I, I really don't regret it. Um, even though of course, a lot of those ended up being redundant. Uh, yeah, I, I, th I thought it was a good decision. One of the better decisions I made. Um, so yeah, I'd be curious if any of the panelists had a, uh, you know, uh, recommendations against that. But um, yeah, my one takeaway is spam applications. Definitely a hot take. Um, I will add the caveat that you should probably only apply to schools you intend to go to and not only apply just to add an application. But I think Austin had that assumption baked into his answer. Um, Andy, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, I totally agree with Austin. Um, and this is actually one of the regrets I had when I was applying to graduate programs was that I uh, was, uh, I think maybe thinking about cost and like maybe doubting my own abilities and and maybe taking advice, too, many, too much advice from other people. And as a result, I think I only applied to um, six to eight programs, I believe, maybe, maybe eight. Um, and I think I applied to Berkeley on a whim, as in like, uh, I looked at my undergraduate applications, looked at the schools I applied to there, kind of like, mimic that list for graduate programs, not really considering the fact that grad school and PhDs are very specific and the program, uh, they vary from program to program. It's not so much like undergrad where you apply to schools that have a high ranking in US News and World Report. You're really looking at what you're interested in, uh, what you wanna do, and if there's faculty there that kind of like meet um, kind of your interests and kind of align with what you wanna work on. Uh, and I do feel like had I, you know, been more confident and applied to more schools, I could have had more opportunities. Granted, I'm very happy at Berkeley. I love it here a lot, but I do feel like if I um, was more confident, I did apply to more programs, I could have more opportunities. Um, and then I could, you know, just give myself more, more options at the end of the day. So I uh, just wanted to echo what Austin said that like, yes, if possible, and you have the energy and you have the bandwidth, uh, apply to all the schools that you think will, um, that you will fit in and that fit your interests well, because this is a very important decision, you know, because I think the PhD is going to be like your terminal degree. You're not going to get any more degrees after this. This is what's going to go on your resume. And that's what people are going to look at when you apply for jobs. So it's a very, very important decision. And you want to make sure you have um, access to the, 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 most amount of, the most amount of options as possible. I think... Um... Uh, although I don't think Austin is wrong. I think there's like some assumptions and caveats that you need to be said. So it definitely depends on who you are and what you're looking for. Um, if you know exactly what you want to research and you are dead set on that, um, you need to make sure that you research that there are professors and outlets for you to do that. Um, if you are someone who doesn't really know what they want to do, then yeah, I think you have the liberty to kind of have uh, applied to a, like a large range of places. But I think two things that haven't been said is that one, uh, for some people, location might matter. Um, so if you are someone who like really likes sun, you probably shouldn't come to Seattle because it doesn't really get sunny here. Uh, and these are things that like you might want to consider is like um, your like emotional and physical health and like is the location going to like hinder you at all? Um, I think that's something that maybe people don't think about. And then um, it does kind of cause some problems for some people. Um, I think because you're all going to be living there for like five or six years. So you want to make sure that if that is important to you, that you take those into considerations. The other thing that I think that we haven't touched on is that 
every program is extremely different and the amount of classes and what they focus on and their requirements are different. And it's something that I didn't really look into when I was applying for schools. Um, and so I think that was a mistake on my part. I mean, I love UW and everything, but um, I think that it would have been better if I had really looked into like what is the requirements and like how many classes are required what kinds of classes are they like focusing more towards you know Bayesian or frequentist or bio or things like that um, I think that those are also things to take into consideration especially if you know exactly what you want to do um, you want to make sure that matches with uh, your priorities thanks uh, Austin Andy and Julian that's very helpful for our uh, attendees I think Definitely the different perspectives and different considerations are important to have. There's not really a one size fit all answer probably in general for applying to uh, PSU programs. Um, I'll maybe ask one more question and move to the Q&A. Um, I'll also remind folks to um, upvote questions they think are interesting in the Q&A so we can get some idea of priority. Um, but yeah, so maybe to, to give a brief sort of um, the start of brief discussion about the application process. Um, I'm imagining what people, most people know, but the general setup of an application to the PhD program is you have your statement of purpose, maybe a personal statement. Um, you know, you have um, letters of recommendation from faculty, things like that. And then you have your transcript. That's in general, what a, a grad school application entails. Uh, and I'm curious for, from our panelists, what parts of the application you were most concerned about or maybe um, most worried about or potentially spent the most time on. Um, speaking for myself personally, I was very worried about my transcript. I felt like I hadn't taken enough math classes. Um, I didn't know if I uh, sort of like the, the where I got my degree would be reputable to the schools I was applying to. Um, and so I ended up spending a lot of time on my statement of purpose and making sure that my, I talked a lot to my recommenders to make sure that they communicated my skills to uh, the places I applied to. But I'm also curious to hear what other people have uh, have experienced in that regard. I think the thing I was most worried about was my statement of purpose. Uh, because I I did not decide to go to stats because I wanted to like focus and learn on something very specific. So I don't know. I just wanted to learn more about stats and more about math. That's, that was my primary reason for applying to PhD programs. So in my statement of, statement of purpose, I was trying to express that. And there was like, I could not, it was very difficult to express that. So it ended up being like, I was interested in a lot of things. So my uh, statement of purpose became very broad. And looking back, I think a lot of places I did not get into was because my statement of purpose was very broad. And maybe that was uh, seen as like a drawback by lots of admission committees. Um, so I think that was like something that um, I was struggling with uh, back then. And I think if I was to give advice to people who are applying right now, I think it would be to figure out why you actually want to do your stats program and articulate that um, and be specific about how you're doing that. Um, I think I felt pretty similar. I mean, I think at the point I was applying the transcript, the letters of recommendation, all of that was kind of somewhat out of my control at that point. There's not much you can change. Um, so yeah, I also think I had problems articulating exactly why I wanted to do a stats PhD, exactly what I was interested in my statement of purpose. Um, so that's really what I was worried about. Um, as far as advice for that, I would just recommend starting early, um, making sure you really sit down, take some time to think about why you're doing this, what you're interested in. I also had people read mine, um, and that was super helpful. Um, so I'd recommend that as well, if that's an option for you. No, I definitely agree with having people read your statement of purpose, especially your, your recommenders. Um, that, like, regardless of how well they know you, ask them to read your statement of purpose, and it'll almost certainly improve the recommendation because they'll have a better idea of what you're trying to communicate, and they can even help you improve it. And that'll they can implement the, the sort of similar language as the, their recommendation as well, which reinforces your entire application. I think. Um, I think Jillian, you were about to unmute. Oh, I was just going to say, I think that the part of the application I was worried about the most was the like research experience. Um, I didn't have much, especially in statistics. Um, so uh, I will say if you're 
uh, if you're like a junior and you have some time, maybe that's something that you can think about now and trying to at least be like shadowing or being part of some sort of research. Um, it didn't end up mattering. I mean, I was able to get into schools, but um, I think that was like what I was most worried about. Um, and again, it just was, I think your statement of purpose is kind of your place to, if whatever you are worried about, that's the place to kind of talk to it. So I think I, I talked a lot about like my journey and how because I did like psychology before and like how that journey like led me to stats. And so like that kind of gave them some insight why I didn't have a bunch of like statistical research. Um, so that I do think that whatever you're worried about, the statement of purpose is a good place to highlight it in your way. <laughs> awesome. Uh, hearing a lot of the statement, statement of purpose is a good tool to um, express your intent and refine your your purpose and goals. Uh, okay, let's start. Say, let's start answering some questions in the Q and A. Um, so the most upvoted one currently is how was the transition between your undergrad and grad school? Um, I'll. I think maybe I had the the weirdest one or one of the weirdest ones because I started my program during uh, twenty the fall of twenty twenty. So my first year was entirely virtual um, and it was a very difficult transition uh, because of that but uh, maybe the panelists can also speak upon that experience yeah I think that uh, my transition um, I mean first of all the like the the more immediate transition like when I first got to Berkeley and I walked into the building um, I thought it was awesome. And I thought it was like one of the best decisions I ever made because I mean, it just feels very different to be in a department as an undergrad versus a grad student. Like, uh, maybe they showed me my office. Like it's, it's nice. Comes with the monitor, the desk, the chair, uh, like the professors actually care to know your name, or maybe they know your name before you've even met them. Cause they were on the admissions committee. Um, uh, like you get to kind of be an instructor almost like whenever you're in, in front of the like the classes helping teach so um i think I, I think i just overall felt much happier in like my day-to-day -day life because i felt like i was a more significant and more permanent part of the department uh, i think the coursework was quite difficult for me um uh, but that's just more of like the same i mean you take classes in undergrad ideally you're taking hard classes as an undergrad. Um, and so like, that's not out of this world. I will say that like the advisor hunt and trying to start research, that's a little, that was a little uh, interesting, a little hard to get a, a grasp on, but the good news is that they expect first years to have issues with that. People are happy to help. No one expects you to do amazing things your first year. Uh, just take your classes, get your bearings. Um, so I think in short, there are some things that are difficult, but I personally recommend not freaking out about it during your undergrad or even the summer prior, unless you're in some special circumstance where you've taken no math or something and you got into like a, a stat PhD program. Um, but yeah, a lot of people kind of wonder like, how can I prep, what should I be doing? And my recommendation honestly is not to stress too much about it because um, like you're really not unique in that regard. Like everyone kind of has, uh, you know, some some uh, adapting to do. Um, and so, yeah, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't let yourself freak out over that. I'll add on to that. I mean, also coming from Berkeley and being in the same cohort as Austin, uh, I echo a lot of those sentiments, like going into, I think, the first year of a PhD program in statistics, you're taking classes. Um, so it's kind of like undergrad plus, except, you know, you feel like, oh, you're only taking maybe two or three classes. And it's not too bad because in undergrad, you've taken whether that's, you know, three to four if you're on a semester system or like two to three on a quarter system. And you think it's not too bad, but uh, those classes are actually very difficult. They're meant to be challenging. They're meant to really expose you to a lot of the stuff in undergrad where they say like, this is beyond the scope of the class. Uh, beyond the scope kind of falls into what you cover in a grad school curriculum. Um, so I'll say that taking those like first, like first year courses in like theoretical statistics uh, and, and applied statistics was definitely like a lot of time. I spent a lot of time like kind of reviewing the foundations, making up for what I didn't learn well in undergraduate and really trying to like understand what's happening and not just like, uh, you know, solve something from a formula. So I think that true understanding does take time. Another thing is like, depending on the program you're in, like you'll have to do teaching your first uh, year. Um, and I think a lot of times, and I think depending on the undergrad institution you came from, uh, you 
mo more than likely don't have too much experience as like a teaching assistant, or if you did, it's probably in a very minimal role. I know at UCLA, like I had experience as a teaching assistant, but definitely not in the capacity that you do as a graduate teaching assistant. Like you have a lot more administrative work to do, you know, you're grading, you're responding to emails, like holding discussions uh, and office hours and stuff. And that will also take up time. So it's important to know how to like set boundaries and balance um, your administrative tasks, like you're teaching, as well as like doing well in your classes and really understanding the content. Um, so I think it, for me, it was important to like, I learned how to like find a good balance between um, kind of all the tasks I had to do uh, while also um, not like letting myself burn out because if it, if it does get too difficult, it gets, it gets very easy to burn out, but you know, that's only the first year. And then you have, you know, four more years as well. So it's important to find that balance early on and then also kind of, build up that endurance during your first year so you don't burn out afterwards. Thanks, Aspen and Andy. Um, does anyone else have any perspectives on this? Otherwise, we can move to the next question, I think. Um, so yeah, so the next question, what's the best slash most effective way to figure out what faculty slash programs align with your personal interest? This is a toughie. I think what I did was uh, I, so I was like working uh, on a project with one of my professors, an undergrad uh, who later became a letter writer. So I went, I scheduled a meeting with him and I asked him, hey, I'm interested in this topic. Uh, what are the programs you think I should apply to? And uh, he basically gave me a list of like 10 schools. Um, and I did that to, with each of my letter writers and each of them like gave me like a bunch of schools and that helped me like distill uh, and find what are the programs that I want to apply to. Um, and I think that's uh, that's what I did and it worked out fine for me um, because I did not know anything about how grad school, grad programs work. Um, so. Yeah, plus one on asking your letter writers. A lot of times they know a lot better than you do on how the field works. The, the what is it, US news uh, rankings can only get you so far. <laughs> After, you know, even the top, a top school, top five school may not fit you because of your research they're doing them and I'd be at all interesting to what you're trying to do. So definitely talking to faculty, uh, your recommenders can be very helpful. I think as far as finding a topic or a subject, I think that's kind of hard. Um, I took, uh, I had to take a bunch of electives for my master's um, and that's where I kind of like found machine learning and natural language processing was in an elective. Um, so if you are in some sort of undergrad or master's program and you have the ability to take electives, um, that could be a cool way. Just kind of like give yourself one class and like look at the list and see what sparks your interest and take it. And if it seems interesting enough, then maybe um, you can pursue it more. I think uh, that's one of the best ways to kind of figure out what you like and what you don't like topic wise. And uh, another thing, um, cause obviously like, yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said uh, before I, I mean on this topic. Um, and like, so yeah, getting professors recommendations when it turns, when it comes to actual programs to apply to is, is definitely good. Um, when it comes to like the, the advice I kind of followed when it came to crafting my statement of purpose is I pretty much had the essay entirely the same for every school, except like, okay, between CS and STAD, I'd like edit some things. Um, but really it was only the last paragraph or two that I swapped out for um, different schools saying like, Okay, and this is why I'm a good fit for this school. Uh, and ideally, you would mention a couple of professors, perhaps. At least that's the common advice I've heard. I'd be happy to hear if any of the panelists uh, think otherwise. But you should uh, find one or two professors at the school with whom it seems plausible that you'd like to work. Now, as an undergrad, I can only speak for myself, but like undergrads largely don't know anything specific about these research topics. Like, for example, I started in the beginning by saying I do deep learning theory. I knew nothing about deep learning or the theory behind it when I was applying. So I, even though it was over 20 schools, I went down their faculty list, clicked on all their websites. Um, honestly, just like essentially control F for like machine learning 
Uh, and if someone had the words like machine learning and also bio in there, because that was kind of my undergrad background, then I would like add them to a spreadsheet as like a potential person. And so it was, it was just like a, um, uh, just like a straight up search through all of the faculty websites. And that, and that, and then at the same time, when I was doing that, for example, there's just like UCLA has a good stat PhD program. Uh, but while trying to find a professor's name to apply to, I realized that essentially they barely did any machine learning in their stats department. So as a result, uh, I ended up not applying to UCLA. So, um, yeah, that just kind of gives you a taste of how I was exploring like the fit of different programs. Yeah, definitely faculty rep websites as well could be helpful. I, uh, one um, difficulty I ran into, ran into is that a lot of uh, department websites are not updated very consistently. Um, but if you know the faculty's name, you can usually search, up, search it on Google Scholar and get an idea of what they published recently. And that helps you get an idea of what they're working on. Uh, I think Austin mentioned having one to two faculty there he was interested in working it with at any particular university. I think I was more like at least five, just because I wanted a lot of flexibility when I was going into the program. Because um, I, I had general ideas of what I wanted to do, but I didn't um, have anything super specific and wanted to give myself room to move around, which is a nice thing about stats PhD programs is that you, you don't go in having to know specifically who you're going to work with for the most part. You can get spend some time. Um, looking around and trying things out before you commit for sure. Um, in general, that is something, you know, it varies a lot person to person, program to program, but that's usually how it's set up. Um, yeah. So, oh, Unique, did you have a something else? Oh, yeah. So, I, I don't have much to add, uh, but uh, for me personally, I, I did not have a uh, uh, exact idea about what I was going to do. So uh, whenever I, uh, the schools I chose were generally large public schools that had a big uh, department size so that when I go there, I, I, I'll have more options. And the, the, in that regard, I think Michigan, Berkeley, UW generally, these are large public schools with uh, relatively larger departments size. Uh, so if you, uh, if you do not have exact idea about which which field you want to work on, I think uh, generally looking for a large large department is a pretty safe option. I yeah. just agree with that. Uh, I started my application process by talking to people about which departments were big, just because I didn't know. I had really no knowledge about um, which departments like did what. Actually, I just wanted to originally just stay at UCLA for my PhD. And that was like my, my top choice. Um, but then after talking to others, like through internships and like my own professors at UCLA, they're like, okay, like here's like some other big schools that you can consider. Um, and that was a good start. It was a good start for me to like look at big schools because I wanted access to a whole bunch of resources and a variety of different research interests because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, but I think it's good to like, I think the very common big schools that uh, are, are, that most people apply to are like, you know, North Carolina State, um, possibly like Ohio State University. Of course, the three schools that are here, like Berkeley, Michigan, and UW, um, are pretty, uh, pretty, pretty large. Uh, so I think starting there, and then also, as someone mentioned previously, taking into account where you want to be uh, physically, uh, the weather, and like whether that's like close to family or what is, if that's something you want, um, those factors eventually get um, involved once you narrow down your list. Yeah, and then sorry to, to butt in and like, I think this just kind of uh, to tie this back to my initial advice of spamming applications, what everyone said is, is, is definitely true. Like you want to pick one or you'll have lots of potential advisors and lots of research topics or like potential directions to go. And I totally agree with that. However, when I was applying, I just wanted to ensure that I was going to end up at a PhD program and like, okay, given that I like, so I guess my, my thought process was I would rather make that decision once I have acceptances in hand. Now, if there's no one that you can work with, then don't, then they don't send the application. Right. But if there's even a few people having a program with only a few people you can work with is better than no PhD in my opinion, you know? So, um, I think that my general thought process was I'm not going to eliminate schools before I even have like know whether or not I can go there or anywhere else. Like my thought process was apply to all plausible options that I would go to if it was my only option. And then once I have acceptances in hand, then I know what I am I'm actually optimizing for. And then I can actually pick 
um, what's best. And like th that ended up working well for me because Berkeley is like, you know, one of the most machine learning focused places like in the world. So like that ended up being very, uh, very good for me. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, if I hadn't gotten into Berkeley and I hadn't gotten into much of other places, I, st I guess I still want to end up at a PhD program. Yeah, definitely a trade-off to be made with um, how much you tailor. You don't, probably don't want to over-tailor, but also um, don't want to um, shoot too broadly at the same time. Uh, and I think the advice about a big department is good as well. You know, some people may shoot for top programs, but you know, Harvard, for example, and University of Pennsylvania have really small departments. And if you don't, if you're not pretty sure there's someone there who you want to work with, then you end up there. You may not end up pursuing the PhD all the way through. Um, so yeah, always good to keep these sort of um, this, these tensions in mind when you're considering where to apply and how many places to apply to. Um, One thing I quickly want to add is uh, larger department also maximize your chance of uh, getting into a program because larger department tend to have a larger cohort size. Mm -hmm. So that's also a plus. This is a very good point. Um, yeah, so... Um, uh, Sarah also mentioned in the chat that there are some questions that are being answered by text. Uh, so if there's there may be some questions you had in mind that are already answered uh, in the answered portion of the Q and A feature. Uh, next question: Is it possible to apply to a stats PhD without majoring in stats or math in undergrad? Uh, I think there's some examples of that on the pro in on the panel, but uh, do y'all mind elaborating a bit on this question? Uh, I have a I have a my undergrad was in math, so I don't know if anyone on the panel doesn't have a math or statistics, but I will say yes, there are people that definitely um, get into programs. I will say that you will have to show, I mean, most likely you'll have to show like the classic math and statistical like requisites. So that has to at least be on your um, your transcript. Um, and I will say that if it's not, uh, you, then a master's is always a good thing to have. Uh, so I did a master's in stats because I had like a pure theoretical math, which is not very applicable as much to stats. So, and I think that having that master's with those courseworks really helped me a lot. Um, but I, I don't know if anyone on the panel doesn't have, has a different journey or. And so I didn't, um, I, I of course majored in like stats and math and mine is CS. So I'm definitely not like, uh, uh, some kind of special um, case in that regard. I think that my impression is like like Jillian just said, it's it's really more about the coursework than your major. So it, you have to have some kind of probability, linear algebra. Like I mean, I can't speak for other programs, but at least at Berkeley, like it's probably best that you took real analysis or like some kind of proof heavy courses, um, because otherwise, you, you like you're just simply not going to make it in the first year coursework and. You don't like the, the PhD program is not going to have you take undergrad level math classes and then get into grad like they kind of need you to take the graduate courses. So I think, you know, if you majored in something else, but then somehow you took those classes afterward, or if you got a master's, um, then that would be good. Uh, but I think I, I really, I can't see them admitting someone who hasn't taken those classes. Uh, and if they did admit someone who hadn't taken those classes, I don't know if it would end up well for them. Like, again, it's, I think it's like, like probability, linear algebra analysis type stuff. Like you gotta have, of course, like Cal one through three. Um, I, th I think those things are kind of a bare minimum. And then I think most departments have similar statements on their application pages around um, expectations that you have taken a calculus sequence from longer linear algebra and some analysis. Um, I think there's different departments may have more or less flexibility on uh, the amount of proofs you've done or proof-based coursework you've done, but it's only helpful to have that um, as you're going into the PhD program. Um, okay, next step. Um, is it fine to take a gap year between undergrad and starting a PhD to explore what one's interests are? What experiences help you determine what your specific interests are? Um, as a side note to this question, I'll recommend applying to RIU programs, research, research experiences for undergraduates, which is very helpful. 
Um, they are basically programs at universities for the most part that allow undergrads, sophomores, juniors, usually, to do research for a couple of months in the summer uh, on a specified topic in a uh, with faculty. And it's really helpful to get an idea of what researchers like and also get a letter of recommendation for your grad school application. But um, yeah, does anyone else on the panel want to add to that question? Yeah, I can speak to the gap year part because I did that. Um, I applied when I was an undergrad and then deferred for a year. Um, and I think this can vary by program. Um, it worked out for me because the cohort I was supposed to be in was actually really large. Um, so they were very happy to have me defer, but I'm not totally sure how that normally works. Um, but for me, I'm really glad I did that. I think I kind of needed a little bit of a break. Um, I took a data science job. I, so I was just working for a biotech startup. Um, and for me, I think that just, it was a nice break. It was nice to kind of have it all worked out. I, I had committed to Michigan at this point, so I knew I was going. Um, but I think kind of working in industry for a year reinforced decision that I wanted to go get a PhD um, and also just gave me a nice little break from undergrad. Um, so I wouldn't, I made it very last minute decision, so I would not recommend doing that. Um, but I think the general idea of maybe working for a year or two um, can be a nice one um, if that's something you're interested in. I took a gap five years <laughs> and uh, it worked out. Um, I was doing psychology before uh, and was kind of working in that and then took a while to get my master's while I worked. Um, so. Uh, I don't know if it's considered a gap year. It wasn't really planned, but uh, um, yeah, I enjoyed I enjoyed my time. It allowed me to work in industry and kind of see what, what I liked and also reaffirm my decision to go back to school, um, get my master's, which was super helpful, especially in the first couple of years of my PhD in the theoretical classes. Um, yeah, so uh, I would definitely say that if you're feeling burnt out, you want to try industry first or any of that, don't be afraid to take any amount of years between now and your PhD. I think it's super normal and it doesn't like, reflect reflect badly um, on your application, as far as I know. Yeah, anecdotally, I know plenty of people who took time off um, a varying length of time in between uh, their past degree and the PhD. So it can definitely be a very useful tool to do whatever you need to do <laughs> before you start your PhD. Um, someone asked, do publications matter when applying to the PhD program? Um, I'll just answer quickly that it, they do matter if you have them, but there's not any expectation that you will have them. The vast majority of applicants will not have publications in any meaningful stats journal. A lot of PhD students don't get them until pretty far to the program. Um, so it maybe will help, but there's no expectation that you will have a, a publication. Um, but does anyone have any divergent views on, on this? This is maybe a bit, also a bit different from CS, where there may be some expectation that you have a publication issue before you join or apply to a program. And stats, it's not really that, there's not really much of that expectation. Um, but yeah, any disagreement on that? Okay. Uh, next up, then. any sorry, advice? Sorry, say something fast. Oh, sorry, interrupt. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so I think that uh, yeah, like I think I agree with Alex that like publications do matter in the sense that having them is much better is like would would help a lot. Um, I think that the message to take from that though is is that it's good if your if your research arrives at some kind of like concrete result. That I think that would that would that would be best if you can say that you kind of arrived at some conclusion or you gave some presentation or you had some poster. Um, I think that that is uh, kind of what they would like to see. Whereas like I kind of messed around with a data set for a semester and then like uh, it kind of like petered out. It's not going to be as powerful as just anything with any kind of concrete uh, resolution. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Having a project that has rounded out is very helpful. And even if it's just if something expressed by your recommender, that they said, you know, this person worked on this project and saw it to the, to the end. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a publication to have that sort of uh, experience that will be useful in your application. Um, okay, next up, someone asks, any advice for dealing with imposter syndrome um, during the application process? I'll also add that we're coming up on 5.50, so 10-ish minutes until the end of the panel. Um, if you have any burning questions 
or would like to upvote any of the questions that are left in the chat or the Q&A, please do so. But coming up near the end. Uh, so I think imposter syndrome is super real in all parts of the PhD, at least in my experience, um, and super normal. Uh, and uh, even though you know that, it still sucks when you're feeling it or going through it. Um, my biggest advice is to talk to people. Uh, don't don't keep it inside yourself. Anyone that you can talk to, your mom, your dad, any you know friends, uh, teachers, anything like that. Um, I think most of the time when I'm feeling it, uh, and I talk to somebody, um, you know, they end up reassuring you. And I think just hearing somebody say like, you're good, you're good enough. It's going to be okay, no matter what, um, like hearing that from someone else just kind of helps. Um, if you know, um, that's kind of my biggest advice for all of that. Um, everything will be okay. You're going to get somewhere, whether it's the first time, the second time, whether it's where you thought you were going to go or somewhere completely different, like, um, you know, if everything is going to be okay. Uh, and if you're feeling that way, uh, the best thing to do is to talk to somebody or, you know, however you feel support is the way to go. Just don't don't keep it inside because um, it just gets worse if you do. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And I think that, yeah, talking to other people is definitely important. And um, like another way, I think I'm, I'm definitely gonna sound like a broken record here because I keep going back to it. But I've mentioned spamming applications a few times now. I think that was kind of my way of coping with that because, I mean, there was no chance I thought I would get into places like Berkeley, essentially, or like Harvard or anything like that. I definitely, definitely did not expect that. So if you, like I said at the beginning, if you had restricted me to six applications, I guess that imposter syndrome would have been, okay, I'll just, I'll just keep it in like the low, like, you know, like not bad schools at all, but just like not nearly as ambitious, right? Because I, I guess I didn't realize my, my worth. So um uh, but yeah, you could have never convinced me to only send six applications to like the top six schools. Like that definitely would not have, would have not have been the case. So I think that, I think what you're saying is very common and that that's how I kind of uh, handled that. Yeah, it's a uh, word taking a shot on yourself as well, I, I'll say. Um, yeah, okay. So a uh, question I like a lot, actually, how much... Have your peers or cohort shaped your experience in your PhD more independent versus, collab versus collaborative? Um, I'll say that it's, at least in at Cal during the first year in particular, the expectation is that you you can't do the class by yourself and you kind of have to collaborate uh, to even get past the first couple of courses, um, and that sort of engenders a really collaborative environment in the department overall throughout the entire program. There's not really much com competition between students at all, or any that I've seen actually. Um, so I think, and I think, at least when I was visiting school, something I cared a lot about is seeing that there were people in my cohort who I would get along well with, who I would uh, be able to work well with. And that's another part, another factor that I considered when I was deciding between schools, not just the school itself, but who I would be in the program with. Um, but yeah, maybe someone else has a different experience for me. I, I just agree with that. Um, the first years at Michigan all are in the same office. Um, so we work together a lot. We're around each other a lot. Um, I feel really close to my cohort. Um, so yeah, I feel like it's been a very collaborative environment overall. Yeah, I totally agree with this. And what Alex said about Cal definitely applies. And you know, my friends in other PhD programs uh, say it's also true that like it's very collaborative. Uh, you know. Um, my cohort at Cal is one of the largest cohorts, I think, in in there in the department. Um, but we're all still, I mean, in the first year, we took the same classes and we worked on the homeworks together. Uh, and like Alex said, it's pretty much impossible to like do these on your own unless like this is like your research area. You know, it's not expected that you do it on your own. Like the professors want you to collaborate. Um, and this is something that that I think most people in undergrad don't do because like uh, in, at UCLA, I like probably never worked on homework with other people. Like I did pretty much everything on my own and I wasn't actually used to collaborating. Uh, when I first, I was like, oh, this is strange because I was just so used to like taking the homework home and doing it and then turning it in. Whereas like now it's like, okay, people are gonna like ask you about approaches and you're gonna have to explain your approach to other people. And it's it, it's uh, it's a very different thing. And I think it's very useful because um, if you understand how to do a problem, that's good. And you will understand your way of doing something, but explaining it to someone else is not always as clear cut as just, you know, showing them like what you did and like walking them through it. It's like other people have different ways of comprehending certain concepts. 
and it's going to help you to like be able to explain that to other people as well. Um, so I think in my first year, I definitely learned the importance of collaboration, um, and like that kind of sets me up well for research because research is inherently collaborative as well. So I think getting that kind of head start early uh, helps with the later goal of research and helps you kind of get more eased into uh, a more collaborative research environment. Uh, I'll jump in for the the UW uh, person or me and Opera, me and Opera in the same cohort. Uh, so um, our cohort's really close, uh, similar to Michigan and Berkeley. We I take first year classes together. Um, they want you to collaborate and work, which is super awesome. That it sounds like most a lot of PhD programs are working that way, because um, it wasn't something that I thought about when I applied. Uh, was like because I also like was used to just kind of working on classes myself. I never thought in, in groups like Andy. I really appreciated what Andy said, though, about like the skills that you learn from that, because I think as um, statisticians, we have to take a lot more coursework. There's a lot more theor theory, um, especially compared to like my computer science counterparts. Um, and they uh, and their cohorts are normally like very large, at least here at UW, and like they don't really know each other. Whereas here we have much smaller cohorts and you have to take these classes together for the first year. Um, so you get really close. It builds community. And I loved all that Andy said as well about like learning how to collaborate as a researcher. I never really thought about all of that. Um, I was thinking more of just like the social aspect. It was great to like come in and have like, you know, 10 good friends and because I moved across the country. So um, yeah, so uh, glad to hear that it's happening at their schools too. Awesome. Um, so yeah, we're all a bit very close to the uh, hour now. Um, before I answer, ask the next question, I'll do a couple of things. First, I'm going to post a um, link in the chat to a Google form for feedback uh, so we can know how well we did and how we can do better next year. And I also wanted to let everyone know about an application review um, service at the University of Washington for people who are applying to PhD programs. I think the their uh, plenary applications are due November 11th. Um, so if you're interested in that and want to get some grad student eyes on your application before you are, submit the final thing, that might be one way for you to be able to um, get some people to read your application. Um, okay, so um, next question I think is uh, on the list. What made your individual applications most successful and how can we make our potential applications as strong as possible? I think people earlier mentioned statement of purpose. They've spent a lot of time on that trying to craft a story about themselves, um, but maybe are there any other perspectives or points in the application you think are useful to um, think about in trying to make it as strong as possible? I don't know if this counts as your application, but um, I hadn't heard from some schools uh, coming up close to the deadline. There's like a national deadline where you normally have to decide. Um, so I actually reached out. I think I was probably on wait lists and um, I reached out and a few of them were like, yeah, if you want to come, like, we'll give you an offer. So I will say um, that it actually UW was one of those places. So um, I will say like, I like my mom told me to do that. And I thought it was so weird. I was like, I can't just call them. And she was like, you should just do it. Like, what do you have to lose? Um, and I'm really glad that I did. So I will say, um, I'll just throw that out there in case, you know, you're in that situation. Um, yeah, that you can you can call and you can kind of check in. Um, you know, don't be aggressive or annoying, but you know, if it seems appropriate. Uh, and I knew a few people that actually that happened too. So yeah, that's a that's a very that's a very good story. I, I didn't do that, but that's a uh, I mean that could like it certainly couldn't hurt. So yeah, that's that's very interesting. That, that that's a good tactic. Um uh, and I think one thing just, um, you know, because like we mentioned at the beginning, like a lot of the most important part of your applications are essentially like kind of fixed by the time you actually get to the deadline. But one narrative I kind of tried to craft my personal statement and one thing I had in mind, um, just going through my undergrad, because I kind of knew, I kind of thought I wanted to pursue a PhD like pretty early on, because like I said, I wanted to do, you know, research, uh, is I essentially uh, just tried to show them that I... I already was a good grad student. Now, of course, I'm not saying that that's true, but like, that's just what I was trying to sell them. So I did take, I saw a question in the Q and A as well. I did take as many grad classes as I could. I did as well in them as I could. 
I did happen to have a publication from an REU, like Alex said. So it's another plus, like definitely apply to REUs. They're free and they give you money when you actually participate. Um, so, and you can even get like a publication. So uh, back on track, I had taken grad classes, gotten good grades. I had a publication and other research history. So what I was trying to tell them essentially is you don't have to gamble like, oh, is this applicant going to perform well or not? Because I was just trying to essentially demonstrate that I could do what good grad students do. Um, you know, and again, that's, I'm not tuning around where I'm not saying I'm actually a good, a good grad student or anything, but, uh, but that, that's what I was trying to show them. And so um, I think that that worked for me. And I, I think that that's a, I think that's a good strategy in general. Yeah, I think um, if we assume that you're you're applying to grad school now, to applying to PhD now, there's not a heck of a lot you can do to dramatically improve your application. But things you can do that can help marginally are things we've mentioned throughout this entire evening, like um, talking to your recommenders about your your background and about your plans, um, working on your personal statement and sort of crafting a narrative about yourself if you have any gaps, explaining those gaps in a way that is convincing to uh, an application review committee um, and making sure that you are applying places that you think fit well for you and that you can convince the committee, the admissions committee that you would feel well in. Um, these are sort of maybe marginal improvements in the grand scheme of things, but I think um, they, can, they can definitely make a difference if you're teetering on the edge of acceptance or rejection. Uh, and also like Julia mentioned, following up after, um, you know, you've heard from other places after the deadline's starting to come up, trying to see if there's any updates they have that can be really useful for this, uh, you know, give them a little certainty that you're interested in the place. Because I think some grad schools uh, may be hesitant to accept someone if they think they're going to go somewhere else. But if you reiterate that you're interested, that may make a difference in showing that you, uh, in like making your application, bring it to the top of the pile, basically. Um, so, some things to keep in mind. Alex, sorry, one more thing. This is something I've heard. I have no idea how true it is. I've never been on an admissions committee, um, but especially for moving across country. So I was a Texas applicant applying all across the country and including Washington. Um, I do know that if, if you're going some, so I have a brother here. If you're going someplace that you have a tie to, maybe you used to live there or you have friends or family or whatever, um, Sometimes if you do put that in your personal statement, it can be helpful. This is what I've heard. Um, I don't know if this is true, but um, because they know that you're more likely to go because I think that they they get tons of applicants. And so if they, and they only, you know, they want to give out a certain amount and get, you know, acceptance rates and all of that. So I do think um, if you're kind of on the edge, if you're like a good applicant, but maybe there's like, they're trying to decide between a few, um, this could be helpful. Um, so I have no idea if there's truth in that, but um it can't hurt uh, if it fits in your application somewhere, so. I believe it anecdotally. It just feels like there are a lot of people who are, um, yeah, who are, the mistress communities are choosing from a lot of good applicants. And so if you could just make that thing, make it just a little bit easier for them to say yes, um, it, make, it can make a difference. Um, we're a little bit past time. I think we've basically answered all of the questions. There may be some other questions that we can, discuss if the yeah, if the panelists don't have any hard stops if anyone needs to leave urgently okay I think there's a, take that as a no um I think this is actually a good question to finish off on that so what is the most challenging part of your PhD and what is the most rewarding Uh, I guess I can answer first what everyone else is thinking. Um, the most challenging part definitely is trying to um, sort of contort myself into a broader culture and regime that is like academia. Um, it's like it's sort of a fairly rigid structure that you have to try to find a way to fit into. Um, and it's not easy always to find ways to bring yourself and put, fit yourself into that, that shape. That being said, I think um, there are a lot of opportunities to make sure that you can like pursue the things you want to pursue while also still making sure you can bring yourself to the table as well. Because you know it's difficult to figure out how to do it throughout the entire process, I'd say. Most rewarding, I think, is being able to have the independence to work on things you think are interesting and talk to people who are doing really cool things. 
I think something I forget all the time is that I go to a very like prestigious university. I, I, you know, pinch myself about it every other day that like I go to a school with some of the top researchers and I can talk to anyone in any field and basically they'll be the top researchers in their field too uh, and learn a lot from them and develop a lot from that. So I think it's really valuable. This is probably true for basically any stats PhD program you go to, you can talk to people in other departments and they'll be doing some amazing things. Uh, and I, I really value that kind of stuff a lot. So, so yeah, anyone else want to chime in? To uh, like touch upon what Alex just said, uh, the cha most challenging part is probably that there is no handbook or guide that says, that explains how, you, how to be a good grad student uh, or how to do research, right? Uh, and figuring out figuring out how to do research and figuring out how to be like a good grad student is uh, a part of getting your PhD. And you can like talk to other people. You can talk to your professors about their experiences, but uh, each of them will tell you different things. And you have all these con conflicting information and you don't know how to apply it for yourself. Uh, so I think that's the most challenging part, like figuring out what you want to do and how you're going to do it. Um, and I think the reward is. Uh, you know, at the end, seeing yourself do it and look back and say, hey, uh, it's been like a year, it's been two years, and I made, so, uh, and I did so many things, I made, I met so many other cool people, uh, I talked with, uh, I read about all these cool research that's been going on, and, uh, and I actually did it, uh, compared to like two years ago, when I was a baby grad student, uh, when I did not know what's happening, uh, I think that's the most, like, rewarding part, I think, uh, Yeah, I think um, the most difficult part, like Opera said it extremely well, is just what makes a good grad student. For undergrad, I feel like it's way more clear. Like, okay, you got your transcript, you got their CV with research experiences, which like, you know, largely you just have to find and then like do what the professor says, um, you know, and you have like your letters. It, it, it's, I feel like it's much clearer, like the objective function is much clearer on what a good undergrad uh, looks like. However, for a good grad student, uh, even even now, I don't know if I have the best perspective on what that means. Because I mean, not everyone who does a PhD graduates like as the best, right? But it's not about their GPA. And I guess the answer to that in short is like, do good research. But I mean, how do you go about that? Especially in theory, for me, um, you can't just like, I'm not saying one is harder than the other, of course, because like it's hard to do good research, period. But like with theory, you can't just like take a data set and like apply some method in a way that no one has before. It's a very, it was very unclear to me how to get started. Um, at least at Berkeley, uh, things are very, you have a lot of freedom, but that is not, that's a code word for saying it's also very unstructured. So even finding an advisor, like that's something you kind of have to do, um, finding your first project. Like a lot of this stuff is just, I mean, like Opera said, I'm just kind of redoing what he said. There's no, there's no guidebook. Um, um, so I think that's the most challenging part uh, that I don't know what point that that gets like much easier. Uh, maybe like hopefully when I'm in like a third or fourth year, I'll have a more coherent answer to that. But um, uh, I think the best part is definitely just the people in the social interactions. Like my cohort is awesome. I love spending time with them. Like we go camping, go on trips, whatever. Uh, walking around, going to talks on campus. Like Alex said, they're top researchers, guaranteed to be interesting conversations. I've been to a few conferences and like uh, meetings in different cities. And it's just, it's actually a pleasure to talk to people, like go out to drinks after uh, like a workshops over or something, uh, just just talking to such interesting people, um, talking, exchanging interesting ideas. That has just been uh, by far the best part, and that honestly makes the whole thing worth it. Okay, thanks for y'all's um, responses. I'm sure our attendees appreciate it uh, immensely. Um, thank you for our attendees to for attending. <laughs> um, I think we can end the panel there. Uh, check up on the Stats PhD website. We'll probably will put the recording of this on there in a couple of days or a week or so. Um, and we also may add some more resources later on uh, if that makes sense for us. And yeah, there there may be also an email sent out at some point with regards to feedback or resources if we uh, end up sharing those. But yeah, thanks again to our panelists, to attendees, for everyone for bringing this together. Uh, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye, everyone. <laughs>